can be done, uh, but we really appreciate you all gathering. Our intent is for this to be an intimate dialogue and discussion with people who have thought about the importance of this great country, this experiment in democracy. Um, and the Kemp Foundation exists uh, because of the legacy um, of our founding font founders, President Lincoln, many other great leaders, and uh, my dad, Jack Kemp. Um, our mission is to develop, engage, and recognize exceptional leaders who champion the American idea. And our goal is for this to be uh, the first of hopefully many Kemp fora on the future of the American idea. But specifically, my hope is that today we'll lay the groundwork for a real clear understanding of and vision for the American idea. We know that we have to be vigilant in protecting this great nation, our ideals and principles. And so coming out of this event, we don't just want to be, have a discussion here and enjoy one another's company and go on our way. We want the core principles to be clearly explained again, understood. Um, <clears throat> and so Mort, who's writing a, a book uh, on my dad, has a copy of The American Idea, um, a collection of dad's speeches uh, from the 80s. We're taking The American Idea, dad's speeches, we're adding to it speeches from the 90s, and we would love to have contributions from any of you who uh, are inspired to write uh, about the American idea, and we're going to republish a book that we then want to share uh, with all the potential national political leaders on both sides of the aisle, and we want to have them gather in this room for one-on-one -on -one interviews uh, on their vision for the American idea, so that in 2016, when we have our national political uh, election, there will be a real engagement on uh, the American idea, um, which as dad talked about it, it's the human idea given a time and a place to happen and best described in the Declaration of Independence. Um, um, so Rich Lowry, uh, editor of National Review, recently wrote a book called Lincoln Unbound, How an Ambitious Young Rail Splitter Saved the American Dream and How We Can Do It Again pretty appropriate for our gathering here. Um, and one of the things that I uh, loved when I was reading his book, he, he wrote this, in Lincoln's telling, Rich writes, America exists to give all people the chance to rise. We are by birthright and through our free intuitions a nation of aspiration. One of the ideas that I hope we can remind people of is that aspiration <coughs> is a noble thing. We, this is a country of people who aspire to great things. Um, we need aspiration, uh, we need ambition, um, and certainly this is a great place to think about those things. Um, so it's a perfect spot to have Rich Lowry open the day um, and talk to us a little bit about uh, Mr. Lincoln, the American dream, and Rich, we really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's real. It's an honor for me to be part of this event and part of this stellar lineup that Jimmy has assembled here today. And I was telling Jimmy just the other day, uh, it's a real sign of the persistent appeal of Jack Kemp and his ideas that the hot new thing in conservative politics just this week, Ben Sass wins the. Uh, primary down in Nebraska, and what does he do in his victory speech? He identifies himself as a Jack Kemp a Republican. So as, as Jimmy noted, we thought it would be appropriate if I was just a table setter today, given that we're in this place. I don't know how holy the, uh, the bedroom of Abe and Mary was. There's probably a lot of, a lot of contention here. Um, but as Jimmy mentioned, I, I wrote a book about Lincoln last year, and if you'll forgive me, just one vignette about that experience. Anyone in the room who's written a book knows when you're a new author, you're completely obsessed with your book to an unhealthy uh, extent. And I was in that state of mind a couple weeks after my book came out, and I was on a flight 
uh, to California that had Wi-Fi, and I was on my iPad checking my, my email every uh, two minutes, and an email came through from my wife saying, did you buy $500 worth with our credit card on Walmart? And I immediately, being obsessed with my book, thought she was accusing me of using our own credit card to buy my own <laughs> book. And I remember thinking, look, I'm a desperate author, but I'm not quite that desperate. And uh, it turned out it was a fraudulent charge. Uh, someone had uh, uh, stolen my credit card and bought something that wasn't my book. Although if he had bought my book, if you think about it, that might have been kind of the perfect crime. Uh, but for, for me personally, the most interesting aspect of this was my wife noticed this erroneous charge like immediately, in, in real time. And it would have taken me months, if ever, to notice it. And it's because she spends pretty much all day monitoring our, our credit card bill. Uh, so, uh, a while ago, um, I was uh, watching, um, I, I was away from home from, uh, for a while, and I, I got back, and she said, I hadn't heard from you from hour, for hours, but I wasn't worried because I knew you were at the bar watching the hockey game. So every beer that I, I bought was coming up you know, on, uh, on her screen. So I know some of the right wingers in the, in the room today might be worried about the NSA creating a 24-hour surveillance state in this country. Don't worry, I've been married about two, uh, three years now. It's not so bad. You, know, you, you get used to it. So let's just um, um, briefly hit on, on what was Lincoln's conception of the, uh, the American idea. And I think to, to get to the essence of it, uh, you can uh, do worse than to go to this wonderful little talk uh, he gave in the White House in 1864 to this regiment of Ohio troops, the 166th Regiment that had been mustered for 100 days of service and provided guard duty around here in Washington. And he said to them, whenever I'm with soldiers, I want to talk to them about what the struggle is for, what is, it is about. And he told them, you know, I now live in this big white house, but one day one of your sons might live in this big white house the way my father's son has. Which is a very strange way of putting it, but also characteristically Lincoln, because it's so modest. It's a way to avoid saying the way I do. And then he went on to say, um, in describing the purpose of the war, it is an order, he said, that each of you may have through this free government which we have enjoyed an open field and fair chance for your industry, enterprise, and intelligence, that you may have equal privileges in the race of life, very char characteristic Lincoln phrase, the race of life, with all its desirable human aspirations. It is for this the struggle should be maintained, that we may not lose our birthright, not only for one, but for two or three years, the nation is worth fighting for to secure such an inestimable jewel. And Lincoln, those are wonderful sentences. Lincoln lived those sentences. All of his policies were designed to give expression to this, those sentences. And his free labor ideology gave those sentences a philosophical bedrock. And just very briefly, in about 10 minutes, I just want to hit on all those things. If, if you want to understand Lincoln, you really have to go back to the very beginning when he's raised literally in the middle of nowhere, first in Kentucky and then in Indiana. And when his family moved, moved to Indiana, there was another family in the neighborhood that recounted um, when they had the fire going in their log cabin, uh, they would see through the chinks in the logs the eyes of bears reflected in the fire looking in. There's a story about a young girl getting killed by a panther in this uh, area because her, her brother didn't kill it quickly enough with a hatchet to the skull, okay? So th this is not suburban bliss. This is an extremely unforgiving environment. His mother and uh, his mother's aunt and uncle all died in short order uh, from something called milk sick when Lincoln was a, a young boy. A, a cow would wander out into the forest, eat a poison weed, no one would know. Its milk would be poisoned. You would drink it and you would die in a week. A horrifying death. And Lincoln has to uh, fashion with his father a wooden coffin. They bury his mother basically out in the, uh, the backyard. Um, Lincoln said there was nothing to excite ambition in this environment, uh, an ambition for education in this environment. His mother signed her name with an X. His stepmother, who was a great blessing to him and a wonderful woman, signed her name with an X. He said of his father that he could barely bunglingly sign his own name. He, he told this to his campaign biographer uh, in 1860. The biographer left it out of the biography because he thought it was so harsh. 
but it was true. And the thing to know about Lincoln is with every fiber of his being, he wanted to escape this backwoods existence. And one of the great ironies of his image down through the ages is we, we think of him as the rail splitter. And the rail splitter president, because when he was Illinois's, uh, nominated as Illinois' favorite son for president in 1860, in a great act of branding, you know, they, they hauled out some rails and claimed that these were rails split by Lincoln. And forevermore, he's known as the rail splitter. But the thing about Lincoln is he never wanted to split another damn rail in his life. A much better prism to understand him with is a story he told himself uh, in the White House about being a young man and having a rowboat on the side of a river. And there was a carriage that drove up. And there were two gentlemen in this carriage who wanted to meet a steamboat coming down the river. And there was no wharf uh, at this part of the river. So someone had to row you out. So they, they see, see Lincoln and say, hey, kid, can you row us out to the steamboat? Lincoln says, sure. He rows them out, helps them get on the boat, gets their luggage on the boat. And then Lincoln says, hey, wait a minute. You forgot to pay me. And decades later, Lincoln in the White House remembers this moment. And he says, to his shock and surprise, each of these guys threw a silver half dollar down on the bottom of his boat. And Lincoln said, at that moment, I realized I had earned my first dollar. And I was a more hopeful and optimistic being from that time. Lincoln wanted an America where you could earn a dollar and where you had to earn a dollar. And in a nutshell, that's why he didn't become a Democrat. Um, now, he's, he's surrounded by Democrats uh, growing up. And Democrats, you know, they worship Andrew Jackson, the great Mars of the American backwoods. And they have a very romantic view of the backwoods and yeoman far farmers. Lincoln wants none of that. He's had that uh, in his childhood up to his neck, so he becomes a Whig. And he's attracted to the Whig economic program, which uh, very briefly is that we're not going to have a barter economy anymore. We're going to have a cash economy, which means we ne need to have banks. We're going to defend banks and financiers and the, the economic elite. We um, are going to have an industry in this country. We're not going to be agricultural forevermore, so we're going to have a tariff to encourage industry. And uh, we want to have an actual functioning market in this country. And to do that, you actually need to connect the country together. So we're going to have railroads and steamships and canals. And Lincoln loves all of those and does everything he can his entire adult life to promote them, pr promote those things. And he's also very attracted to the cultural element of the Whig program, which it says, OK, we can do all these things economically. Um, but we need people who are uh, prepared to take advantage of this. And for that, you need people who are self-disciplined and hardworking. And Lincoln himself was an evangelist uh, for this ethic his whole life and exemplified it uh, himself, the sort of Whig view of the world. When he became a lawyer, young uh, aspiring law students would ask him, how do I become a lawyer? And Lincoln would write back these letters saying, work, work, work is the main thing. His stepbrother stayed back in the backwoods and was um, short on cash his whole life and would constantly ask Lincoln for loans. And Lincoln would write back these letters that I assume were well-meaning, but uh, they were extremely uh, excoriating. I mean, they, they would, would have meant very awkward Thanksgiving dinners. And one of these letters, Lincoln writes back to his stepbrother saying, you are destitute because you idle away all your time. Go to work is the only cure for your case. And Lincoln himself, at a time when America was soaked in alcohol, was soaked in tobacco, when coarse language was the norm, he didn't drink, he didn't smoke, he didn't swear. Told the occasional off-color color story, but he didn't swear. And at a, it was a time when casual cruelty to animals uh, was the norm. And Lincoln was embarrassingly tender-hearted towards animals. We had the statue out here of, of Lincoln communing uh, with his horse. There's a story. Um, that a visitor to the White House told about the White House cat. There was the Lincolns had one. And this visitor was invited to a dinner. And Lincoln was sitting in a, one chair. And apparently, the cat was sitting in the chair right next to Lincoln. And Lincoln was using the official flatware of the White House to feed the cat, which, as any married man uh, would expect, outraged Mary Todd. And she says to the visitor, don't you think it's crazy the President of the United States is feeding a cat you know, with the official Flatware. And Lincoln says, no, no, no. If this gold fork is good enough for Buchanan, it's good enough for Tabby. <laughs> so, uh, so what does Lincoln do with this ethic of self-improvement? He makes himself a lawyer. 
Um, he, arguably, uh, this is a kind of an anachronism, but you could say he was the foremost corporate lawyer in the state of Illinois. He's on retainer from the, the biggest corporation in Illinois, the Illinois uh, Central Railroad. And that doesn't really accord with the popular image of Lincoln. But for Lincoln, it wouldn't have been a contradiction at all. And this goes to his fundamental um, uh, economic views where he worships property rights. He worships the rule of law. He thinks if you have a properly functioning economy, there should be no such thing as class conflict. He opposed what we call redistributionist economics. There's a delegation of working men who came to see him in the White House during the war. And he said, let not him who is houseless pull down the house of another but labor diligently to build one of his own. And undergirding all of this was just a profound belief in the dignity of labor and the right to the proceeds of your own labor. Lincoln loved the line from Genesis, in the sweat of thy brow thou shalt earn thy bread. Or as he put it more informally, he who makes the corn should eat the corn. And he just felt this very, very deeply. Um, as his father was failing, um, and getting physically weaker when Lincoln was um, a teenager, he would hire Lincoln out um, in the area to do uh, hard labor, all this kind of stuff you'd expect on the farm, and Lincoln would get paid and his father would take all the money, which was his father's right until Lincoln was the age, age 21. And Lincoln years later in a speech said, actually said, I used to be a slave, which is obviously uh, an incredibly self-pitying exaggeration, but it, it speaks to how deeply he felt uh, this principle and gets to his opposition to real slavery and that famous phrase in the second inaugural, right, what does he call it? It's, it's unrequ unrequited toil. It's having other people work and it's you taking the proceeds uh, of their uh, labor. And if you, if you read, um, Lincoln thought that this principle is so basic that there's really no misunderstanding it. He said, you, you know, you can see an ant with a crumb, and if the ant finds the crumb and is dragging the crumb to its nest, and you stop the ant and try to take the crumb, the ant will fight you because the ant knows that crumb is now its crumb because it has worked um, to, uh, uh, to, to bring that crumb to its nest. And he thought only, the South could misunderstand this only willfully. And um, he was... In, in the 1850s, if you read things he, he wrote and said, it's just suffused with this profound sense of loss because he thought the founders had it right. They tolerated slavery, but they didn't celebrate it. There was no affirmative defense of it. They just tolerated it because there's no good way to get rid of it right then, but they thought eventually it would go away. But in the South, in the 40s and the 50s, you saw an affirmative defense, a positive defense of slavery uh, growing up. And for L Lincoln, this was just shameful national backsliding. So his, his fundamental project was forging a renewal through a return. And any time in American culture and American life, we tend to celebrate what's new. That's, that's kind of a natural with our, our um, national character. But Lincoln was unabashed in celebrating what was old. He would refer to the founders as those iron men of those past, the old time men. Our founders, he would refer to the, uh, our, our fathers, he would refer to the uh, old Declaration of Independence. In his famous Peoria speech, he said, we need to readopt the Declaration of Independence. Or as he said in a, a wonderful uh, phrase, our Republican robe is soiled and trailed in the dust. Let us repurify it and wash it white in the spirit, if not the blood, of the American Revolution. And I, I think today, obviously, it's different circumstances. We don't have to be as depressed uh, as Lincoln. But I think there is cause to be dismayed uh, or at least concerned about the state of the American dream. And I think in broad brush, our project should be forging progress and forging new opportunity through the prism of those old ideals uh, in the founding. And there's a, a wonderful passage often quoted um, in Lincoln's Lyceum Address when he was a young man in Springfield uh, before anyone had heard him, uh, where he talks about how even then, you know, and this is, this is a very immature country um, in the, the early, mid 19th century, even then we were invulnerable to military assault. He said you could take all the armies of the world, put the greatest general in history, Napoleon, at the head of that army, that army could not take a step on the Blue Ridge Mountains or take a drink in the Ohio River by force of arms. Then he goes on to say famously, if destruction be our lot, we ourselves must be its author and its finisher. 
as a nation of free men, we must either live through all time or die by suicide. And I think what today is all about is that it's through the beliefs of figures like Lincoln and Jack Kemp, it's through the American idea that we live. Thank you very much. Thank you.